the next episode of the Cathode Ray Podcast. My name is Louis Zezer, and I'm joined here by my friend Steve Nutter. We're just chilling out. We're just talking, just me and him, Steve, just catching up uh, on the last week. So, Steve, how you doing, mate? Well, I'm doing pretty good. It's uh, good to be back. Just, you know, maybe take a brief minute to <laughs> catch up with you. I feel like the last, uh, last two episodes have been pretty epic. I mean, we had a lot of fun with um, our last two guests, you know, and mm. So sometimes we can uh, take a chill out and, and break in between them because we've also been talking about how we got other people shuffling around to try to have them on and have, uh, you know, introduce new people. I mean, I think I had a lot. We had a lot of fun talking with Roger, yeah, <laughs> you know, great fun. And then, of course, um, last week with uh, yeah. talking Macho. about. Yeah. With the with his projects and the GameCube is really cool. So. Uh, yeah, you know, we'll just check out, see what's going on with uh, outside of that this week. It's uh, yeah, just, just good chilling, to catch just up. Just working on the, the things we've been doing for the week, just catching up with that. Um, yeah, we're trying to like alternate where possible, have some guests and then have us and you know scheduling things and so forth. So we got some good ones coming up, though. It sort of takes a while to find times with people and book them in and, and get all that. But I'm pretty happy that things are... A rolling now and uh, the episodes are getting a good am amount um we're we're recording this just a couple of days after we released the one with web hdx on the gamecube that's getting good traction and i was hoping so as well that people would want to hear that and i think we uh it was good i think we like took it through like let's take it very systematically let's talk about what you do talk about the gamecube bod answer some of the questions i was saying i was uh, i like the way that you pose some of those questions to to matcha and then going over his thing. So hopefully people are, are enjoying that. Yeah, hopefully people are enjoying, you know, that and, and getting kind of, um, you know, just an opportunity to hear more about things from these creators. And I had to laugh because we had we had a great conversation um, about how he had specifically designed the mod with a certain intended, you know, wire length even. Mm -hmm in mind and how important that was and then i saw like on facebook and these modding groups these guys are like oh i've come out with the new super easy ribbon cable that you could put in and and have a ribbon cable to it and then i'm like oh man here we go we already got the genius coming out and i was just thinking about that and uh, much of makes conversation good right after uh, like hearing that how like somebody yeah and just a, and i was like this is exactly what he's talking about somebody's yes. going to do this they're going to have trouble because the ribbon cable's <laughs> too long and they're going to go brother matcha so uh, anyway that was uh that was a fun like bring the whole thing full circle from the interview uh but yeah it was great to get in there get deep with him with him um and i'm excited too to see how much stuff he actually has coming that's not out you know, yeah, it's really cool, man. There's uh, uh, you, with this uh, sort of uh, energy that we've got around the GameCube right now. I've got my two. I've got my PAL and my NTSC GameCube sitting right there, ready to swap between them because one does S video and the other one does RGB. Because I don't, I don't have the component cable, so I need both of them in my setup. And it, it also turns out that my PAL GameCube is delivering me really shitty composite, and I don't know why. Uh, maybe someone in the comments can know, is it, someone tried to tell me it's a cable issue that the composite is different between NTS and NTSC and PAL. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, or is it sometimes consoles can do that for whatever random degradation reason over time that some, one of the video outputs can be not as good as the other one. So I don't know yet. Is it my PAL cube? Is it something I did? God knows. So I've got both of them ready to go. And there's just not enough homebrew on the GameCube. One of my favorite GameCubes, I ironically, if I'm going to play Quake, I play it either on the PC, because of course we're sitting here on the PC, but there is a, a Quake port to the GameCube and it's great. Like it's just a perfect normal source port. You can play it with dual thumbsticks and it works just fine. So often, a lot of the time, I find myself just sitting down playing Quake on, on the GameCube. So, and I would love to see even little things like there's no Doom on the GameCube or there's no, you know, the real staples that you usually find on every homebrew platform. And do I really need another place today play Doom? Not really, but it does make a comment on uh, how common homebrew is on the GameCube. And right now, not so much. So I'm hoping more happens. Yeah, that would that would be really cool. I, I think that uh, 
another example would be like the Dreamcast has a great kind of homebrew scene mm-hmm. where you actually have two two people that are like dedicated to bringing out titles, you know, new on there that are coming out that are just independent, re- re- you know, releases. And then, um, so it would be great to see that kind of resurgence within the GameCube because uh, it's a it's a great console. You can always go back to the GameCube any era. It doesn't really suffer from a. I don't think there's a lot of like graphical issues from that time period where. If you can get it to look right and set up right on either a flat screen or really a CRT, uh, then you, you know, mostly a CRT, but it looks good compared to like if you tried to go and show people the N64 or something, you know, it's going to look nasty kind of. But the newer graphics, they they hold up well to this point. So, I think they hold up real well. And part of the, when I was making this uh, video that I made last weekend about the LG uh, retro CRT that I had, I was sort of just poking around here. What have I got that's composite? And I pulled out the Mister and I, I hooked up, you know, some Mike Simone's adapters and I, you know, it's fine and we got it going. And I didn't, couldn't find anything else that was composite hanging around here. I've got a PAL Super Nintendo. I thought, oh, okay, I'll hook that up. And then it, it dawned on me, okay, I've got these two GameCubes sitting here. The PAL composite didn't work well. But then when I hooked up my NTSC, the Spice Orange one you could see there, when I put the composite cable on that, oh, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, composite. When I put that cable on that, oh my God, it just looked so good. And it, it for me, it was nicely smoothing out the 3D games of that era. We know they're a little rough. We know the polygons are a little bit uh, simplistic. E- even GameCube, N64, very much so. But but GameCube, maybe, as you were sort of alluding to, it's on that edge of where the graphics are, are very good. And the composite, for me, especially if I sit a meter and a half back, it's something like that, what I'm usually sitting, my, maybe my 42-year-old eyesight makes a factor in that as well that I, I was really liking the the composite video it really smoothed it out just to the perfect amount so it is that nice nice in between generation yeah and i mean that tv looked looked really awesome that you showed off that you found um mm-hmm. you had said you know should i buy this i was laughing i was like of course i, I couldn't <laughs> even find anything about this tv uh after you said it and i know there's like another LG TV that that looks even more retro that came out after the one you got that mm-hmm. is like super super high rare and, and like sought after for collectors uh but this one is just maybe right before that one and I was like heck yeah man grab that thing because you never know when you'll see another one oh yeah and then I and then I watched your video on it and I was um I was blown away really by how just the set had great uh you know geometry pretty much like right out of the box it looked like it was even set to a good aspect ratio like i was looking at that and i was like that looks like it barely needs really any adjustment and it's it's it just looks really good with the uh composite video even though it's just composite like you could mm. and you showed the scan lines a little bit which was barely cool. anything the the top right is a little bit off like yeah you could play with the corner a little bit but it's one of those ones that as soon as you take away the grid you never i mean i've got some deflection yokes that are just terrible you're watching things and you could just see the the wavy lines in video but as soon as you take away the grid you would never notice that thing and it was so clean on the inside it was pretty filthy on the outside i had to give it a good old rub down and with some household cleaning products so surprisingly the inside was only no, i mean no dust Maybe one near the power supply gathers a bit of dust. I don't know if that's a a known place for gathering. Uh, have if you noticed yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, because it's a spot where it gets really hot, and then mm. um, you know there's th- there will be a little bit of attraction there, uh, pulling in dust from um, like the transformers. There's generally a lot right. of those little transformers in that area, and they'll get dust on them, and then the ICs build up dust on them. Um, and so, yeah, that tends to be an area that builds up dust. So just a little bit around there, but everything else was great. So we got uh, very lucky, I would say, with it, uh, with, the, with the set. Um, and also my, my girlfriend is liking it. She's good with it. <laughs> so right now, yeah. we've, where the thumbnail is, we've still got the TV set up in that position. Cool. 
And what we've been doing is I connected now the PS3 to it. And the PS3 can play modern uh, file formats like MKV files, like the new Mat- Matroiska or whatever it is. Um, and it can play them directly off the retro NAS. There's, it's called Movian is the media player for PS3. And it's really good. And mm-hmm. I was, I just pointed it at the retro NAS. It fa- got me the files and we're watching Simpsons. We're watching Star Trek. We're watching Buffy four by if you, and, and the trick I found is that if you're going to the Pirate Bay or wherever your choice of media distribution outlet may be, uh, they often they have the the Blu-ray 720s or whatever, like the 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 remastered. But there's usually the older ones, the 240p versions, and you can usually still find those somewhere down the list of available media options. You get mm-hmm. those, you get a 240p out of that, and I mean it's an authentic experience. Uh, it, it it was it's yeah. been going really nice. So that's yeah, that's that's fun. That's a fun uh, thing to have set up for that. So uh, I had a question for you, Steve. Sure. And you could be honest. Let's let's go through it. I you watched the video. It was one of my first ones of doing a tour of a TV set, mm-hmm. and I didn't know what I was doing. I sort of just jumped into it. I inadvertently did this, but it turned out to be good that I filmed the introduction. And then I said, fuck this, I'm done for the night. I'm just going to sit down and play it. I'm just going to sit down and enjoy it and yeah. use it. And, and often sometimes when we're, we're making content for YouTube, it's, it's all business, business, business. And there's not enough time to sit and, and truly enjoy the thing that we're, we're talking about. So I had that time to sit and enjoy it. Then I woke up in the morning, did the rest of it. Uh, but still, it was whacked out in 24 hours. So what are some of your feedbacks? Like, what do you think I could have maybe improved? or changed or focused on or did I blabber on or do you have some thoughts on it <laughs> well I mean no I, I well sure I'll give you some feedback mm-hmm. yeah you're like right on the spot here no I, I, it was a really fun for me because I liked the fact that it was something different um I liked the uh you know the oh you did a great job at the opening I liked the way that you situated the tv <laughs> in front and like we're sitting back and it actually looked good and um, that's something different, you know, than than most people who, you know, work around CRT. So I really liked that entrance that you did your spin on it. And I feel like um, it's hard for me to say nowadays, it's so much harder for me to have time to watch a longer video sure. that's on about a tube. And so I like I used time yesterday to try to catch up on a lot of these videos uh, that have come out recently uh about tubes and um some of them are a little bit longer and i mean it's all great you're getting more information out there it's just i feel like um i do like your videos that are in that um you know 12 to 15 minute range at the most on something like this i thought it was cool too how you did find something new about the tv where um you're talking about you know the uh the rgb oh yeah available input Mm -hmm. there so anytime that you're adding like more stuff than like expected right because we and i hadn't talked about that video and that's a lot that you got in there it's surprisingly a short amount of time um for how much you got done on it so um i mean that's really kind of like what i thought was great was how you just had you know anytime you add something different and that's what i try to like feel like even if you're making a good video at a certain length and then like what what can you have in there that's maybe unexpected okay. and like with this one it was like that whole behind the scenes of how it, you know the difference between it being out of this region for me i can't see any of those things and the c cam difference and also of course that rgb input i thought that was really cool so um i would uh try to if you're you know that's what i try to think about with my stuff now is like how can i make maybe because it, it, a lot of times i'll come across something that i've a monitor i've covered before but how can i make this one different right and so i think any time that you come up with an original idea like that it's really good and i'm glad to say that video really did real well for you mm, mm, i'm re- very happy with, with how it's gone it's nice for me you know as a as a you know, newer content creator to have that video that just goes a little bit well it's about 3,000 now, and that's just tremendous. I'm, I'm really happy with that. So I, 
And it's, it's interesting what you say about, yeah, fi okay, finding a unique thing. Is there something different? Here's a set. Congratulations. It's got this input. It looks nice. Bada boom, bada bing. Can you find something to say about it that that's a bit different? And I... I specifically did this style where I filmed the introduction before I opened it up and I didn't know that stuff, right? I had a little suspicion. Only I had a suspicion that there was some funny business going on with the SCART and uh, composite inputs because all the information I'd found in the rest of Europe was this is a SCART TV. So, because I had to then process my disappointment that I got it. I'm like, where's this composite? Why? Ah, come on. The what? I've been here rambling on about RGB SCART. It's what we do in Europe. Healthcare. We're great. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and I was then, laughing. I was like, yes, I remember that. That uh, was a good joke. <laughs> and and then I did it. So it sort of just got my mind thinking, like, is it? And I think I, I actually forgot to mention it in the video because the question that also came to my mind was, fine, you've designed this TV that accepts RGB SCART. Uh, why didn't the LG engineers just design composite and SCART at the same time? Apparently, it was easier for them to just resolder a composite head-on rather than just just make a TV that has both inputs, and then you wouldn't even need to change the model number to go to a different market. So this adds, and there's probably some like obscure business decision. Oh, we had more composite plugs left over in the factory. <laughs> <laughs> and so we did some shit like that, right? Or some weird oversight that meant it didn't get dual inputs. Like, why didn't you just add composite in in the first place and save yourself retooling this this thing? And it would be love interesting to know. Yeah, that's a good question. It's like that's but that's specifically that's the way so many of these. That's why there's so many different model numbers on these CRTs, mm -hmm. and you'll come and open them, and they'll have all these big just open areas of circuit board where mm -hmm. parts could be populated and it, it, whether the parts parts are populated or not depends on what region it's in and also the model whether it has some extra features or it might have something additional inside of it mm -hmm. and a selling up feature but it's you know this one is kind of like a weird anomaly because it's a rare tv it was a rare design it's not sure. they didn't release a huge number of these and then, like you said, it winds up being just in this composite-only format uh, over in a, you know, a market where you're surprising that this style of TV wasn't like tried to be pushed in more of Western markets, you know, as like mm. some kind of like culture. Th it's just weird. So I, I don't know. It, it could have been like one thing where it's like, well, it's just cheaper to do it, finish it, finish off this run like this. Yeah, maybe they that... had like a grand idea where they were going to sell a lot of these, and then they got the market research back, and it's like, no, you're actually at the end of the CRT life cycle, and you just need to cut these loose, the whatever thousands that are made, and they just say, screw it, let's just get them out of here, and uh, who knows? It's it's you really could have just put interesting. one of those SCART to composite adapters, those cheap right, things, or just right? even a SCART input that could have done, you know. So they've determined that it was cheaper or better or something to redo the back panel rather than just throw a plug in. Okay, we're selling them in Russia. Do the same thing or we're selling them in some other market that needs composite. Do the same model and just throw in the SCART adapter <laughs> as well. That wasn't, you know, they actually had to. And you can see that it's really just the top plug. I, I, I'm quite sure that once I clean out those solder points, a SCART plug is just going to drop yeah. straight in to that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we'd love to hear the backstory. It just, yeah, it right. Like, how did this actually get drawn how up on a... How did this get to that? I've understood... With if, the pitch meeting. Like I've had one or whole... two people from Western Europe, so guys in, in Germany, in Netherlands, countries like that, say that they see those TVs fairly commonly not all around the place but they're also not like they seem around which okay. means that that probably it seems to be their major market was western europe some in america we know that some were you did you find any for sale on america no eBay i have or not, no like uh -uh. that's the thing i couldn't find a single thing and then i couldn't find them uh, when i was watching your video you know it did say 50 hertz too so i know your set's not you know that's a, that's whatever pal region and mm. so yeah it's not um it's not one that I actually found over here at all. 
I could only find uh, a couple of people. Someone else had done a video on it maybe a year ago. Like they had right, one. Just sort of, yeah, outside. Sure I have another yeah. philosophical question for you, Steve, about this monitor. Just to, again, if we're like these questions that it poses mm-hmm. about the TV industry in the year 2000. Um, <laughs> now, when we look back now, 22 years later, we're like, this TV looks cool as shit, right? It fits it. We like the styling. The styling has held up. And I, we like that it's a reasonably modern tube, but it's got this sort of cool styling. However, when I think back to that age, and it was the year 2000, we're like, oh my God, the flat screens are coming. The big screens are on the way out. This is old technology. And I know we, we like that. <laughs> You're right. Back then we looked at it like it was old. It was like, because th- we we're like, dude, this was cool when Apple introduced this. You know, this was cool and sexy like six years ago. And then everybody, like you said, was jumping to like black flat screens. And you're like, whoa, whoa that looks yeah. great, right? So did people think at the time that this style was cool? Or was it just like, oh, what a cheap Apple ripoff. Apple did this six <laughs> years ago. I don't know. I'd love to to get a real, because I, have a, I, I just suspect that we might have thought that as kitsch or cheap or sort of a no namey brand version well, of what Nintendo or it's yeah, so it's well, an interesting know, thing to think about because also this they I mean there's there's uh different colors of it. Yeah. There's a like purplish one mm-hmm. and then there's a green one too uh, mm-hmm. on top of the orange orangish one that you have. And um First off, I'll say I think the orange one looks the best out of all of them. But it means that there were a bunch of them, and it would have been funny to go in and probably go to, like, a TV store back in that year, mm. and you would have seen, like, a little section. And I imagine it was trying to, yeah, maybe you're thinking, well, this is trying to, like, get the attention of somebody who's sending their kid off to college in a dorm room. Mm. So it's, like, smaller, looks cooler, so it's it's really like a niche marketplace. But again, like you're saying, it's going to these places where I don't know if that's actually what, you know, the, the marketplace is doing there. As so it's it's odd. It it feels like it might be a little bit of a kick. Try to be like if I'm a marketing guy in those years. I'm thinking that like I'm kind of an out of touch marketing executive mm-hmm. who thinks this is like, oh, this is gonna be hot yeah. with the kids. Right? Like and then it kind of falls flat. If you go into an electronic flat. store right now, you can find a number of radios, I guess even CD players made by cheaper manufacturers. Now, LG is not cheap, I would say. It's not the top top, but they're all right. You know, so it's not a no-name brand either. But you can see a lot of, right now in any electronic store, those, like, they're meant to look like ye olde ones. They're meant to look like they're something from the 70s. And I just can't help but think, is it the same? Would that have would that TV have come out then and gone? Ah, oh, it's just the cheap. Looks like the Jetsons. The, who wants the Jetsons anymore? <laughs> I want flat screen. I want. I don't know how we. I would love to. If you've got some thoughts in the, please write it in the comments. How you think you may have it's seen like, this television? It's like in 2000. When, yeah. It's like when your mom tries to buy you something cool, yeah. and you're like, Mom, this is not <laughs> cool, Mom, yeah. or something. Yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting point to think of it at the time it came out. Because nowadays, like you said, there's all kinds of weird stuff that was completely just awful at the time. And a lot of that stuff is the rarest because there wasn't a lot of it made. Mm. And then at the same time, um, like it's become the more sought after, too, because of the oddness to it. This might have been an idea, like you say, that they they put this idea together. They tested out for some reason in regional, like like a focus group for each country, mm. and for some reason maybe over in the Russian area it was like, well they're like a little bit higher, but it's like it it's like at the America they're like this looks like crap to like the American kids now they all want this other trendy um, stuff because mm. they're not into that style. So it I didn't know. go to America so much, but somehow Western Europe was okay with I, that. I don't remember a lot of TVs Russia. like this, even the ones that were clear and stuff. They weren't very prevalent. Um, Did you get that prison TV in the end? 
Yeah, oh yeah, I've got yeah, it here. Right. I've still got yeah. it. So I've not done anything with that yet, and I'm going to do something, obviously, when I get it ready, because it's my favorite one <laughs> that I have. Oh, I haven't yeah. really done anything with it, but just the whole idea. So I don't know what I want to do. You know, I've got these concrete blocks in my back basement, and I'm like, I need to set this up with like an intro where it looks like I'm just walking in. I put on an orange jumpsuit. <laughs> And it looks like I'm like walking into a prison scene and I drop the CRT down and then I'm like, oh, well, at least I got YouTube. And then I just go into me like tearing it down and, you know, normal <laughs> video. So uh, cool, I wanna, yeah, yeah. yeah, I want to do something like that with it. But I've, I've, I've yet to have the time to really get into that thing. But that's one. Um, and then, of course, I've got the, the clear green one. Um, since the last couple of weeks, I did do an RGB mod on one of the right. small Sony uh, sets that I had, and it came out really good. Um, the The set is it's ridiculous; it has no no like good options for geometry in it. Not even tilt or pin. It's just like vertical and horizontal hmm. stretching and moving pretty much on this particular set and. So I'm going to have to open it back up and try to move the yoke around. But I just had like spare parts here and I followed the guide on uh, Andy's website okay, yeah. and it worked out. Was it just out. connecting to the jungle chip? Um, it was to connecting to points on the board that came from the jungle chip. And the jungle mm -hmm. chip actually, um, surprisingly enough, I, I picked the wrong point on one of them. So I had some trouble to begin with when after I did it. But we figured out that I had soldered to the wrong point on the board <laughs> and it just didn't show any any signal at all. The hardest part was this particular jungle chip had the RGB uh, right next to each other, and they were all on a ground loop together on the chip. Hmm. So I had to take a uh, razor blade, and I had to actually cut the traces in between the chip on there so that the uh, so that they wouldn't be grounding. Uh, so that wouldn't be. Then I was injecting according to this guide, um, hmm. and actually. Um, if you give me a second, we can pull sure. up that guide and just pull up and I'll show you what I had. Uh, let's see over here. So the three, as, as it was existing, the three grounds, because usually there's a ground for red, a ground for green, and a ground for blue, and they were connected together, and that was yeah, let's producing bad here. grounding or bad interference? No, it, for my problem was because I had connected to a wrong point on here. Oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah, um, here, let's do this. Let's do yep. a share screen real quick. And so this was the actual, this is Andy's website. And this was the model TV that I had got. This is the one I had bought with the prison TV in, in Texas. Mm. And um, I, I think I paid 75 bucks for it. And it came with a remote. Worked perfectly. Uh, pretty good shape. Anyway, I got the circuit board out. So here's what I'm talking about. This is the actual... Here's the actual circuit board diagram that I'm hovering over if you're watching, but it shows the chip, the jungle chip, and then pay, uh, number 15 is a blanking, is the blanking signal. Right. And sure. then 16, 17, and 18, see how they have all come down here, uh, and they're all on this ground-like line together. Well, that all translate in reality to them just being on the same uh, connection point here where there is just you know, they're grounded together over to this point. Oh, so okay. because that when they designed this TV, they're like, this is not RGB. All they did was ground red, green, and blue. Is that what you're saying? Well, this has something to do also with a t a tuning the signal mm -hmm. so that it won't uh, be too bright or something, even for just the OSD that it's normally using. Because that's right. what it's using in a normal set for RGB. It's using your OSD. You know, that's what it's... The, op, the actual menu, that's why you're able to do RGB in those sets. Mm. Is That's all the information being translated. Anyway, you got to cut. The hardest part was actually coming in here and cutting the traces in between those points right there okay. with a razor blade, which, again, you see how it says cut traces right here? <laughs> yeah. And that's the two lines. You have to cut the trace. Mm -hmm. And then you remove this one. And it totally isolates that whole area anyway by removing that resistor. Um, so, I mean, you just do really what it says here. Uh, the, thankfully, this includes like the muxing and everything. So I get the mm. uh, board up, but I had an extra SCART adapter. And so I just followed the pin out where you go 
from your red, green, and blue, which I'll go down here and show you how it's connected. Like, see that blue, green, and yellow right there yep. in that picture? Mm -hmm. That's the red, green, and blue. Let me see what the others are. The blanking is up on the chip above, so there's the blanking, mm -hmm. and then that's the 5 volt. So that's what's going to the actual switch in the front where it turns it from regular mode to RGB mode. Now, that's that goes off to a switch. The RGB goes in here. That pin right there, I believe, is a grounding pit trace. Yes, right there. And then mm -hmm. so is that purple one. And then over here you have where you connect in to the, the uh, audio line and the composite video line then for sync mm. as it's sent to the television. And so that's pretty much exactly how I did it. I installed the same style switch in the front, mm. and then that's exactly – I mean, mine looked a little bit rougher. I didn't make it look that good. Mm. But I, I wound up uh, putting my SCART right there, and I didn't have okay. any uh, things there, so I actually just – epoxied it i cut out yeah. a, i cut out a spot right there with my dremel mm -hmm. and then i epoxied it in place and i'll eventually do a video on it because it was it was i mean it came out cool fun little project it didn't cost anything extra um but and all uh, the moxing stuff you sort of just did in the cables you didn't put an extra didn't make your own board for it well that's part of so you put a resistor here too Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's like putting that's that's in the switch. Mm. So that's part of how the muxing works. I know is like it goes normal mode and then, you know, you're sending the five volt signal to the blank. You know, switching that blanking line together, and engaging it. So mm. I don't really understand it as much as the other way. It's kind of interesting, uh, but I had enjoyed it because I like I said the other ones I had done, there wasn't um, a guide like this, and. I did have uh, the only thing you'd really get a guide for was where to inject you where the RGB is, and then you'd get a guide on how to build out this. Um, and so if you did that right, that's where your signal is being tuned properly. Like you come in, mm. and like this is the green, right? It comes into this SCART adapter where you're going to put your green signal into it, mm. but you're connecting, you're you're soldering in a. 0.1 microfarad capacitor right there. <laughs> From there, you're connected that to the green pin. At the same time, you're uh, connecting a 75 ohm resistor, okay, mm -hmm. into that same point, and then you're putting that together on ground, the ground loop of the uh, SCART adapter. So that's mm -hmm. why you see this looping. These are just ground pins, so that way everything is looped together on a good ground loop. All the connections are looped together on a ground like that. And so that's just the trick to it really is just putting it together correctly the way it's designed. And then that attunes the signal. And if you think about it, what it's doing is it's coming in with your red, green, and blue. Mm -hmm. And then you're, uh, you're going 75 ohm resistance to ground, which is the same thing you're doing when you add a 75 ohm terminator to an RGB monitor. True. True. So true. that's what's your that's that's the process of how it it actually looks when you when you build it out together like that um so it's really nice that there are these guides here and yeah. um once i did it right it was working perfectly like what i'd done before i did something stupid like i accidentally soldered this purple cable uh like on this point or something okay. or this one and it was the, i was i didn't really check or, and i put it on the wrong side and so it didn't work at all and, th and of it course, didn't damage why would you anything. know without Andy's help? I mean, Andy's made yeah. this amazing database here. It'd be so hard to know otherwise. Right. And he's got alternate points here. And um, so this, the good thing about this is this is a pretty standard television. Mm. Really, really like low and low cost. It only came with consume or uh, composite and RF to begin with. And... So if you find this TV for cheap in your area, it's 13 inches. It even has a cool trap door, but it's so basic you could tell where I have another one that has an uh, an input under this door for um, composite. But this one is just using the same form factor, and there was nothing in there but a audio jack for headphones. Sure. So it gives you a great spot to install this switch, and uh, really, it's a good 
it's a good project for somebody if they're wanting to get started in something like that. It so honestly doesn't seem too hard. I, the only thing that's... It seems what's probably is the most tricky is putting those resistors and those capacitors yeah. in line. Building doing this. that, Building that. And I think uh, we, we spoke a little bit previously about Retro Castle from, from China Ivory. So I'm still trying to exactly pick through what it is that he's created, but I believe it's a, a board that probably encapsulates a lot of that muxing stuff that you've got there. So it would have just the RGB connection on one side, scarred out on the other side. And I think he's uh, made it so it's a bit more generic or a bit more can adapt to a few more different designs. So I know you want to get your hands on one of those. Uh, we're talking with Andy first because Andy's sort of, because I don't know the RGB modding stuff as well as he does. So Andy's sort of picking his brain right now. And we're just, me and Ivory and Andy are picking through that in a Discord chat. And we sort of get to the bottom of this board that he's created because Ivory, he, he's some kind of genius, right? He's just very good at this. So when we kind of get it out, then we're, I'll make sure one gets to you. Don't worry. I'll make sure. Yeah, I think that would be fun. End. I really liked uh, the idea of this. So if you, if you do think about it, you could make some kind of generic board as we're just looking at this. Hmm. build out right here where everything does connect into the SCART that's the same on all these points and the only thing you do on the board is if you need for some reason I mean it's probably not going to change on a lot of these parts but you would just for example add your own uh, surface mount capacitors or hmm. surface and surface mount resistors uh, in these spots and if I think that the difference might be something up here where you have this blanking switch if that's somehow involved in all this you know, incorporated in this, in the design of the um, board going to the scart head, then you could leave that blank. And again, you just whatever your design then on your specific television calls for, you would just need to add those specific parts on a board as opposed to going in and finding the parts and correctly putting them together like this. And it, I mean, even when you do this right, it all feels nerve wracking because mm -hmm. look at it. I mean, there's a lot of exposed um, tracing there that uh, you can get interference from or you could easily have something crimp against it and cause a short. So it's not, uh, as this sits, even when you do it correctly, it's not like the greatest feeling solution. Actually, speaking of that, the, the good old classic... HV to to horror, the the com sync combiner sync that combines this one that we've talked about many times on the show. This is broken right now. Uh, I think it's yeah the resistor here oh, yeah. <laughs> has broken off, and it's just because you know it waves around right. I'm trying to keep it all together, but this big chain of a, kind of a long RGB snake. So uh, and that one I can't kind of repair. Is I'd have to sort of replace that whole thing. So that's. Again, something where excellent prototype has worked well, but that was a bit finicky. You can see how I've, I put the, 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 the bits of rubber around there to shield that and that same thing. But various times these have come out and I've had to resolder them back in and this is all sort of a bit wobbly. So my next uh, mission with this, I think is, I was thinking about what to do with this. I don't have a 3D printer. So if I had a 3D printer, I could probably just easily just make something to hold it in. Um, I think that I'm erring towards, this would be a good example of how to learn how to make a PCB. Really simple, Put make it even make it through hole soldering, make it as big as it needs to be for even an idiot like me can solder. That Get, would be great, yeah. Consult because you got a lot PCB of room there. Guides. Yeah, I got a lot of guides and I don't need a case the PCB would keep it. So it's a little bit of extra work, but it's like now I've got this extra inspiration to learn how to use KiCad or, or something like that. So it's coming. It's coming. I'm glad. Yeah, that's that's what I was hoping you would say. That would be the solution. That would be great. Even like you said, and, then, and I think that would be a cool video to even go like, look, I made this thing and now let's take it and I'm tired of it falling apart. Let's move it to that. See, and this is something I haven't had time with, and it's something that you're doing the same thing with I could do on this one. So I have so many of the SCART head to BNC adapters mm -hmm. that you got get off like eBay generically or any of the cable manufacturers make. And what I'm talking about is the breakout cables that have BNC for red, green, blue, and then sync. And then they'll have audio cables generally. 
And then the other end is a female SCART head that you plug in and you plug out of a switch or a console. Sure. And the problem with them is always at the other end where the BNC adapter connects to the PVM or to your equipment. And for me, the issue is I'm using them on so many different devices that I'm physically taking that on and off, on and off. Mm. And it causes the connection where that little cable connects into the BNC adapter always to become weak. And then it frays. And then I see the grounding come off. And then before long, it's losing signal completely. And then that is like not something that you can cut, cut apart and replace that BNC head. So it's like the worst, man, because I'm always like every time. So I just make my own and I have to redo this if I do it this way. So mm. my whole thing was like, why not have an actual just breakout circuit board that does one end your SCART to fem your female SCART in mm. circuit board. Other end is just a BNC of RGB and sync. Right. And then audio. And that way you just connect your regular BNC heavy duty cables to each end as long as you need to and use it that way. And I still to this day, I cannot believe nobody's ever made. Just Wait, a I know that exists. Device like that. I was like about that. to say, I know no, that. I, it does. Exist. It's everybody just uses the cable des design, which goes at least in America. All right. I'm going to research this because I'm pretty Because if there sure is something out there that I've seen it needs some. to see it. But this is. Well, I was about to say because. And then yeah. you could do sync, uh, you know, whatever, add sync sure. to specific sync types if you want to. Well, there's but value I always in making it yourself. Like, because I think my adapter already exists, I'm sure, on PCB way or something like that. But the point is to make it, yeah. to learn it, and to, to do it. I'm just, I'm really sure I thought I saw someone like that. Let me, I'll make a note. Yeah, look at I'll, it and let me know because crazy. that would be yeah. fun to look at. But that's what I've always like because I know that I would use it and it would save me so much. Because mm -hmm. I just rip through uh, the other ends of those adapters. It's just they don't last. If sure, you, especially, yeah. But that's the difference that you are using it multiple times a day. Yeah, I'm not like off. a normal person. It's like the worst quality well, for control. many reasons. but Right. <laughs> Good one there. So, yeah, that's kind of uh, right. an issue with that that one cable. and But I like that. Yeah, I think that's a good challenge. Maybe over the next couple of weeks, months, however long it takes, we can both try to do that. Yeah, I'm going to um, do that. Mm. So what have you been working board. on? What have you been working on in the last week? Well, so, yeah, I've got... Um, I've been riding again the wave of the large CRT, the large yep. CRT wave on YouTube, so... That video uh, I put out like 10 days ago and it's still getting like 5,000 views every two days. So I've got another video ready. I'm just, you know, waiting to put it out a day or two from now. Uh, but I've just been here working in the shop mostly. I've been uh, going through some small repairs. I was talking to you about uh, eight, eight inch PVMs. So I've, I've been acquiring quite a few of them i've stacked up four now and they're all it's funny they all have the same issues that we've just been talking about <laughs> um and i actually have i'll screen share some stuff with you this so we've mm -hmm. got i've got these four pvms and uh, i've been ordering them and they've all come from the same seller on ebay for the same amount of money like 155 dollars right. shipped and every single one of them is listed with the black and white screen problem which you went through on your live stream which was fun so if anybody needs help with that, go watch that Lewis's live stream for now. And uh, absolutely, you can see how that works. Video from RGB Rob also. Yeah, had if you want to do that whole concise, like yeah. um, Sony bullets and repair, you can do it that way too. That's really good and lengthy mm -hmm. and uh, detailed. So anyway, I've gotten a bunch of those, and I just the real reason I wanted to get them was you and I were talking, and we were like, well, we should do some more research, kind of, as to whether. This needs the full repair because I was like the worst case scenario is I just have to do the full repair like mm. Rob did. Or if it's just the solder spe specifically on these points, then I'll be able to notice that do a case study of getting four or five of them and seeing if they all fix from one little thing. So that was the original idea. <laughs> but I bought the fourth one and the guy 
um, who sold them to me on eBay, finally messages me and says, do you do you want to keep buying these things? Because I've got a few more. <laughs> and so I'm trying to like talk to him this week about getting more of them uh, as opposed to him just individually keep selling them and I just keep buying them. Because mm. if I know how to fix them, that's a good that's a good price for me. I could get recoup that easily and uh, fix them, get you know good research done. So let me show you. I'll show you another thing here on uh, this file here. So first off, I got some pretty new uh, solder gear here, oh, which yeah. you can see set up. Ooh. This is my new bench stuff. I finally got this all set up. This FX nine five one. So. I got, um, after that museum job, I went and reinvested in some new equipment and I finally got this fan so I don't have to worry about huffing. Oh, it's a, oh yeah, anymore. yeah, for the solder fume <laughs> fan. Okay. So that's what that is. That's a new iron. Huh. Uh, that's cool. a, That's been really fun to mess with. Mm -hmm and uh get to work with how are you um, how are you finding the the new soldering iron is it just i mean yeah you okay one before or you've noticed yeah i difference? had the smaller hacko that was like the hundred dollar one that you get off amazon and it's still good um but i'm noticing that this one it just gets to temperature really quickly uh the tips seem more precise it's new of course the other one i've been using for five years that's fair enough. so uh, rather than just, you know, I just wanted to go up to the next level and see how this one works. And I heard good things about this sure. and it's got a very broad amount of tips you can put on it to do different things like really fine tipped surface mount work. Mm. You can get these really small effective tips on it. And if I wanted to get like a circuit, like a, you know, <laughs> whatever magnifying glass, um, microscope and, so anyway, that's the one. And then there's, of course, the old desoldering tool. But that's one of those uh, PVMs right there that I'm working on right now. This is oh, what yeah, I was calling the... This is what I was calling the... That's a the BVM, isn't it? The HR no, Trinitron. No, it's just a isn't PVM it? in America. Oh, yeah. wow. Because I thought... Yours is... There are BVMs of it. Yeah. Right. My one is a BVM and says... Because I have uh, in my collection the 9L2... Because I have all, I have four oh, have of the BBMs, L2? and then I have a nine L two, which only says Trinitron, doesn't say HR Trinitron on it, but it's a PVM. Yeah. Okay. And actually, I forgot I ordered a nine L two also <laughs> this last <laughs> week, and it's supposed to be here probably today. I don't know where that is. I actually need to check shipping on that. I forgot that was uh, that was separate from these. So I've been buying a bunch of cheap nine inch ones that have been showing up. Um, this is the one I was calling Tony Montana's PVM, but it's because it's covered in like white asbestos looking dust, we'll call it. I mean, covered in it. Um, it came from the Home Shopping Network, which is kind of funny. In America, we had... Oh, it says there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in America. So during the, the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, this would have been in like the broadcast booth where they're like trying to sell God only knows what to people at home through the television and they're broadcasting it and watching it through these uh, specific PVMs. I always think that kind of stuff's cool. Like the history. of them. <laughs> That's cool. Home so, shopping network. Yeah. So journal broadcasting that is, group. That whatever that back is. panel is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. as the BVM. Yeah. So okay, then there's no, the true, serial. true, true. It's not. If I look okay. At yeah. The you screen. have SDI sync down there mm. or SDI at the bottom. Right, without the battery pack. So, okay. Okay. Broadcasty SDI. All right, fine. Yep. See, there's a little difference. And then that's what mine says in the corner where yours says nothing right now. You're showing is this little, mine has this little label. Mm, do I have, oh, I have it over the other side here. Yeah. Yeah. There and you go. don't have no, battery no, base. Four, 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 so and that's like a little difference. So there's a little bit difference. But as, as you can see, this does 50 and 60 hertz. Mm. So it doesn't matter. No, you would expect, yeah. I, I yeah, so either one that. of them do the same thing. But, yep, there you go. Good so old gray can, screen. <laughs> you, yeah, there it is. So you can imagine that the there's not a huge difference. I mean, it would be the tube line count. What would be what would you think is the major difference now between, let's say, your PVM variant and my BVM variant of this? Well, that's the good thing is this. The reason I wanted these was they're the higher line, line count ones, uh, which is the 450 line count tubes and that's mm -hmm. why yours says hr trinitron 
is back in these days they used to put that on them when they were the higher line count PVMs. Uh, okay, yeah. so like, okay. if it doesn't say that and it's eight zero four lower than four or nine lower than a four, it's going to be the lower two hundred fifty line resolution tube. So it's not as sharp as this um, mm -hmm. this particular tube is. And uh, that one, of course, has the grayscale problem. I'm getting about. myself old. What the and then finally, what, here's what that the line cap count is of 944D. Uh, PVM, PVM. So. The 4.4 and the 4.5s, like the one you have, is going to have the higher line count tube in it. So that's good. It means it's sharper and um, more desirable. Mm. For sure, than the than the other ones, um, it's just a little bit sharper image. I'm just looking down the TV lines, resolution 450 TV lines. Yeah. Okay. So, and that's about is is 450 about the maximum you got in a, a tube that small? Um, that's a good question. I think that was the maximum, but they may have done more on one of the BVMs, the, the nine inch BVM screen, but I think it has the same tube as this, but they might have gone, may have gone to 600 on a small. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, uh, but that's pretty much the standard for that smaller one it was 450 sure. was the sharper and the majority of the others were 250. And then when you got into larger sizes, they started going up higher in the screen resolution. Because right. 13 inches, then you could go all the way to 800 lines. And I believe even some might have gone up to 1,000 um, eventually, which is infinitely more than 200, even 450, you know. Yeah, sure. I mean, 1,000 is what your high-end BVMs are, what your 20-inch your high-end right. BVMs are at, right? Yeah. Yeah, and then so... I've got that. I've got that one PVM on the bench. I'm trying to get that worked through and done today, um, and then it's got a good tube on it. So I'll I'll offer it on Patreon for sale. I'm sure, and then just kind of start going through them like that. And um, I may keep one of them or something eventually. I don't know. I, I got the nine L, which I really wanted because it has the card bay. Yes, and it has an OSD. Happened. Mm -hmm. which none of these have. Yep. These don't have any on-screen menu. They're all manual, which is completely fine. They tend to be more durable like that, but I've just never had the nine-inch size one um, come through here, like for sale. Every time sure. I see one, they're like $300 plus, uh -huh. and this was 150 shipped. So I just said, yeah, I'm grabbing so it. So I guess the to explain to people, the, the, the PVM 9L2, same form factor, but it's got the input cards at the back. If you saw the pictures that Steve and I just put up there, there's no input cards. It just is what it is. And the 9L2 is taking the same input cards that the, what is it, 14-inch ones? What are, it's a lot of them. Lot so of it's, them the, it's the 129X goes right. in there. That our friend Mr. The Martin one, yeah. has, has, has produced. Which Martin, of course, diverse engineered, and then uh, there's a lot of different good resale resellers of that card that are making them. Mm. So that's uh, that's been pretty well worked out. Everything in that card, and there's a lot of different form factors you can actually get with that. That card will work in here, and then there's others that are made from Sony that will work in this one, and they're matching up the same kind of cards that were in the other L series. That would be the L even five from like the 20 and 14 inch uh, L fives and mm -hmm. L four L two. Um, it's just for some reason on this particular one, they only have built in S video and B and C for composite video on them. Mm. Which is why uh, my nine L two doesn't have any cards in it. And it would be certainly cool to order one of those cards and get it done. But considering I've already got four 9044Ds <laughs> with RGB already, while I would like that cool card that Martin has produced, I can't justify the cost of whatever, 100 bucks or whatever it is, just to do it on that other PVM as well. But if someone's looking to pick one up, the L2 is great because of the cards. That would be very good, uh, something to look out for. Well, and it's one that I've never done any kind of uh, coverage on. So I'll be able to do a video on it, and um, I have I have stacks of these 
prototypes that Martin had made over the years from years ago. Probably have half a dozen of them. And I, so I have a lot that I can use with it rather sure. than, and they're just weird ones that never had anything done with. So if I ever got creative, maybe I could come up with something fun to put together on a video with that too. So, um, for me, there's a lot, there's a lot good for this model. Like a lot of, it's one that's been on my radar just because there's not a lot out there on the model yet and not a lot known. I feel like about it. As, so you happen to just find the 9L2 just in a lot or yeah, just somewhere well, else just happened to come along. Mm, my secret, my secret, <laughs> my secret is not tell you my secrets. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. Okay. So <laughs> I go, um, I, when I track eBay stuff, I just try to find the newest listings of things right when it's getting listed. Mm. And if I find something that I'm looking for, that's on my list, that's meets the price. I don't hesitate. I just usually buy it. Um, if it's especially buy it nows, you know, mm. like, and if I find something that's meets my price list, it says buy it now shipped mm. and it meets all that. And it says like make an offer. Sometimes I'll just go ahead and buy it now and not bother with making an offer because I don't want to make an offer, wait around because yeah, I've yeah. done that before and had someone come in and just buy it because it was a good deal to begin with. So the idea is just I keep looking and then I'm like, ooh, one comes available for like 160 bucks. A lot of the times they are high risk of, or not high risk, they're, they're listed as not working or the best deals and if I can tell from the listing what needs to be repaired, it's even better. Right. Mm -hmm. So at some price, actually that my next video is about a 13 inch PVM that was listed as flood damaged okay. and, um, untested. And, uh, so we'll see how that one goes, but yeah, it's, have you got that video? Have you, yeah, did you the manage video's to, done. Spoiler and, alert. Did you manage to fix it? Yeah, it's, I mean, it, <laughs> it was pretty easy fix, but yeah. it, um, yeah, it was one that I got for off an auction for $105 shipped. And again, five shipped, 105 shipped for a 13 inch. Uh, it was a PVM 1343 MD. And okay. I mean, it looked rough as all get out. Nothing looked broken except for there was a section of the bottom of those PVMs, they're plastic, mm -hmm. like the base plate. Yeah. And there's a section of that that's busted out. So I knew that was there. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things where we we're laughing with Roger a couple of weeks ago where I'll order them just to see if they show up and not in a thousand pieces. <laughs> and it, people just get lucky. Like what in the world? How did this survive? Mm. Just, it looks like it got rolled down a hill and then you pull the monitor out and it's still like in one piece and you're even buying broken ones and you're like, Oh my goodness, I can't believe this survived. So it was, it was definitely a not great packing survived a trip. And, um, I've got it fixed yeah, on the shelf. And, uh, so it's, it's one that I will eventually restore mm -hmm. and do something with, uh, but it's working. It's back there in the stock pile. <laughs> well, that reminded me that, uh, I think it, I think I'm coming to the time where I want to have a go at my 14 inch PVM. That was the one that was in the car fire and okay, didn't yeah. burn itself, but it did get, um, well, water damage, but it's not water the Fire Brigade use, right? There's some mix of, there's chemicals. So stuff did get into it. I know it turned on afterwards. I left it for a few days, but then it stopped working again. So whether some corrosion has eaten into the board, it's been about 18 months. So I, I think there's something in opening this thing up and just seeing. I didn't know, I haven't had to spend as much time with Steve uh, back then. So I know a lot more. Maybe now is the time for me to tackle this restoration project on the on the 14 inch pvm um i think the smell has gone out of it because those chemicals that the fire brigade use smell a lot so we're gonna see there's some the the metal has uh like smoke damage on it so some of that okay. maybe i can buff out the screen i could probably buff that out a little bit um so we'll, it's never going to look perfect it's always going to be you know look a little bit frazzled and a little bit but uh i think i'm keen for it 
Well, I think that would be a cool experience too to see kind of how that looks after that. Like you even just film and open it up and explaining <laughs> the story again, kind yeah. of briefly, and then going and saying, "All right, let's look at this," because unfortunately, the 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 real thing that probably has happened is maybe some of that chemicals gotten in there and would corrode some of the mm. a lot of the solder points on the yep. main circuit board on that monitor and that's because that's a double-sided board with a lot of surface mount components on it and um so it can get damaged and yeah um but i think that it would be cool definitely hopefully not that you know hopefully it's just like a couple points you can easily tell or like a yeah. fuse popped or something, something and it like just that. looked Let's good see. inside so that's that's i think that's a cool thing though that's there you go there's something different whereas mm. just getting a 14 m, m series now and probably opening it up and showing people is something that's definitely probably been done <laughs> sure <laughs> i think it's been done a few times by so, yourself no it's doubt. yeah so it's like but that's cool because there's a connection you can put into that story mm. um i like that right yeah, there like so that. that's like yeah way to relate it back to you uh, let's see so, what, uh, so you've got you we're working on the, the the small eight inches anything else you've been going through yeah i was gonna say before we go on uh, one more thing i have been using the company uh you ship in america mm. to ship a lot more monitors lately and I just wanted to say that if you are considering shipping bigger monitors and, and look, Lewis and I don't get kickbacks or anything. I'm just trying to tell you <laughs> things that I've used that work mm. and that have worked. And I've been very happy with how things have gone with you ship. And it's not a standard like big time company experience. So I don't want you to think that. Uh, me telling you this like it's not like a standardized business as far as what you get when you go to a big box shipper that's all doing things within one company you ship works a little bit differently and then um, i can just give a little bit of an information on how it works yeah please do and then i'll tell about my experiences so far with it so you go and you have to create an account on their website but what it is is it's um you either you you may have an item that you need shipped that's very big that's fragile or that's like pallet on a pallet uh, for us the perfect example are these pvms bvms especially anything that's over 13 inches it should not be shipped uh, mm. by ground it should you should try you ship because what you're getting with you ship is somebody's coming um, you you create your listing of where you have this thing where it needs to go there's a couple of options on there on how to pay for it, but the best that I found is Uship will give you a guide on how much to price it. And it gives you like your chances of getting it shipped are really high if you book it at this price. So for the last one I had to do this week, it was a 20 inch PVM. It was packed in a crate and um, it's one of the crates that was sent to me in like that that I've shown on that you line makes, but it it's would, just a palletized yeah. wooden crate. And the, it was going from here to Ohio, which I think it's like 800 miles or something. And the shipment, when I go on to ship, I put in the distance, the size, what it is, and it gives you a rate and it says like 250. So I had to basically say, okay, that's like the best chances of having it priced at 250. If you, price it lower than that you're not going to have a good chance of getting it listed or picked up so that's the way i always do it it's kind of like ebay you have the option to sit there and auction it mm -hmm. like your shipment or you have the option to get bids and then you're going to get bids but it seems to me in my experience with dealing with it following that price guide and naming your price basically at the high price always seems to work out mm -hmm. uh, so i just name it at the high price really transparent with the person who's getting this recipient package received to them so in this experience it's 250 dollars you ship charges a fee of 25 dollars for booking this okay so Do you pay that cost, or that comes out of the 250 no you have to pay that on top of the 250 the 250 okay. is negotiated to this i'm sure that they take a back-end cut out to yeah. give it to the job to the to the 
trucking company. But these companies that they're, they'll come and they'll bid and they'll pick up your load. And it's always like a shipping company that's small and they have uh, either a van, a cargo van that they own, or it's a trailer being pulled. That's a cargo trailer that's smaller. And again, the good thing is, is it's going on the truck. I'm watching it being strapped down to the trailer and it doesn't move from that point. And then the driver literally takes it within 48 hours straight to wherever it's being delivered along his route mm -hmm. and then delivers it. And as the person who booked it, I don't release the payment till after it's been received by the person. So the driver doesn't get paid till I re re know he's been received and then I release the payment to him. So it's just um, the real thing you're getting there is a peace of mind of how you know in my area you can ship it far. And um, now I couldn't be like eager. It took about eight days or not even eight, maybe six days for this to be listed and then to finally be picked up by a, a driver here. But uh, the driver that I met here gave me his information and he's like, if you want to try and book something with us, along this road, you know, you could call us and we'll tell you a rate. And so now I can call them and just cut out you ship if I want to, and to <laughs> deal with their company directly. Sure. Um, but if it's just one time and you have a big shipment, it's the way to go because it's such a, a high rate of not damaging a big monitor. Really? It's easy. It feels easier to pay something like 250, even 300. Okay. Premium amount. Fine. But to have that real, as you say, peace of mind, like if it's 300 from UPS, ugh, but 300 when you know the guy, like it's easy when you like, this is the guy, this guy is getting right. the money. That well, is easier to, to do that, I think, to stomach and, it. And here's the other thing about it. I'm getting comfortable with this stuff to where um, I want to start talking to these drivers. They they take furniture pieces and like electronics already. And they're used to moving these high-end items without you boxing them. Mm -hmm. So if you can save money on not having to pack and unpack a PVM at all, and they can still put it on their truck just as the PVM, and they offer blanket wrapping. So they yeah. just wrap it in a moving blanket, mm -hmm. and then they move it for you in that way. That could even save you to where you're not you know, this is going to be the same cost as it would be as sending it on a risky, uh, even perfectly packed mission, you know, over to wherever using UPS, FedEx, for example, ground shipment. It would cost less if you used U ship and didn't have to pack it, you know? That's a good point. So, and because that's, there's some personal responsibility from that guy because he is your guy, it's not yeah. just the faceless corporation, he's taking charge. And if he accepts, when he accepts it in a certain condition, part of the U-ship thing is you list a picture of your item. And if you list a picture of the item of a PVM, if it's shipping that thing, it doesn't look that bad to ship. Like if you're a shipper, right? You got mm. just a cube thing and it's not, it's got handles on it. You can see that in the pictures. You give the exact dimensions. And when they come over there to pick it up, they have to take pictures of it and load it on their bill of lading app. So they take the pictures of the same thing as when they deliver it, they give the pictures. So they know that, yeah, they're not getting paid if they do a bad job and break something. And I'm not saying that nothing could ever happen because again, these people are driving on roadways where accidents happen. So there is still a 3% chance that they tell you of a damage, but they're covered under professional uh, insurance policies. And you can pay $50 additionally uh, to use ship for additional insurance if you want to there's that option so if you want more peace of mind you can add it um, actually I've not had to add it on the two shipments that I did because uh, I was confident you know but I've done actually it's been there's been two that I've booked on there myself and then I've done with clients three other ones outside of that it seems pretty clear as the the larger the monitor gets the better it is to use something like you ship and this also comes into the the discussion around why you mostly work on professional level monitors and not consumer sets one because they're all sort of random designs and two you're still gonna have to spend 250 bucks to ship this thing 
on top of the cost of that. So it, it only starts adding up and making sense for a professional level unit. Yeah, you're you know, you're talking about investing um with with a shipment like that, you're talking about investing over a thousand dollars into mm. your device and you know unfortunately 60 percent 50 percent of that is tied up in shipping costs most of the time and transportation back and forth mm -hmm. so if you're within uh driving distance it makes it much more tolerable just because it's not if you think about the ch cost just to get the monitor service it's not unreasonable or really expensive it's kind of crazy to think that you got to pay more to ship it back and forth safely mm -hmm. than to actually get the, the work done on it uh, but at the same time, there's there's no real trick. Unfortunately, you got to just pay it and and you know trying to save money is when you're shipping something like that is always a recipe for disaster. Mm. You know, if you take a shortcut, it's always gonna you're always gonna regret it in a shipping something like this. S so this makes sense as the monitor gets bigger, but what about as the monitor gets smaller? So let's say soon enough, you're going to be sending out these eight inch screens yep. and they have their price at their certain price point. What's going to be your go-to when you start shipping those? And now that's a good, good point to bring up. Those are much, much an eight inch or five inch is super simple to pack because you can easily, you know, layer up, with so much bubble wrap, like you get a roll of 150 yards of bubble wrap and yeah. you could wrap an eight inch PVM with all of it and then throw that in a bigger box. And it's like <laughs> impossible, right? To penetrate mm. seven inches of just bubbles every direction around the PVM. So that's the good thing. Um, and I did have a 13 inch get shipped because I never was able to find a, um, a, tr a trucking company to pick up where it was headed to. It was headed to South Dakota, which is kind of out in the West. And uh, I believe that's somewhere near where Mr. Adams may have moved to. I can't remember exactly what state, but anyway, okay. that's probably good. He, um, you know, it's, it, it, it had to get shipped out there mm. and I was sweating the whole time waiting for it to show up. Mm. And, I had packed it like crazy. You know, I had this medical. First off, I had rolled it. It's 13 inches, rolled it up in all this foam and, or bubble wrap. And then I had this really nice collection of just foam pieces. Like I buy furniture, right? And it comes to you in a box. And it has all these big like rectangular pieces of really nice styrofoam. So I would collect that stuff. And I've gone through it all in like shipping three things. But when you get those, those are really great to put like between the wall of the box and the item you're shipping just to give it something soft to be suspended to buy as opposed to just putting it all on the uh, bubble wrap. So I did that and then I had a double layer box and then I surrounded that double layer box with another double layer box. So it's like four layers of cardboard. And then I, you know, taped the thing all up and shipped it. Yeah. And that actually worked good. And you can still do that with a 14 inch. It's just, again, it's, it sucks. Cause you know that the box is going to have to, f you basically have to get the thing ready. You know, um, have you ever, have you ever heard of this show called, uh, it's, it's, it's called forged in fire. Oh, it's they on make the a knives. where they make the knives. Yeah. And yeah, you know, they yeah, spend yeah, yeah. like, so they spend like, I mean, let's say you get to the championship round and you're mm. at your home forge and you spend all week making the sword, right? Right. And then even before they're testing it, you're going to test it yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes you like you're you're it's the, you're about to submit your packaged <laughs> <laughs> You're about to submit your packaged PVM to the to the judges who's like FedEx, right? They're going <laughs> to be like, "Ah, I, is your PVM ready to be shipped across <laughs> the country?" Well, we're going to put it through the hammer gorge test. And it's like, <laughs> it's just showing like a, a FedEx driver accidentally knocking the box out and like backing over it twice. <laughs> but even before that, you're like in your shop and you're like supposed to like test, like those guys are testing their weapons, you know, yeah. they'll like cut a, a, a water bottle real quick. They're not even like 
you know, going for the big thing that they know there. So sometimes I want to just like kick the box over and see, see like how it lands yeah. and see what happens. I'm like, this is, this is too much. This is too much stress. So I always no. try to do, even with 13 inch now, mm-hmm. I've been shipping them via U ship if, right. if I can. So I'm sure. How would you, uh, so let's say you did the, the, again, but coming back to the eight inches, you're going to wrap them up in the bubble wrap, bo- double box, triple box, quadruple box, all the things you just said. Uh, what's an average, is there an average shipping rate you can expect to then send that via ground or via a commercial uh, provider? Yeah, I mean, you're looking at probably a hundred bucks right. about maybe, maybe mm. uh, depending on how close you are, you might get it a little less. If you're far away, you might have to pay hundred and fifty dollars or something right. it's really uh it's not cheap anymore right it's good to know that fuel costs the, you know your fuel costs go up that's the things we're aiming for so eight inch monitor via ground regular company 100 120 something like that you ship you're looking 200 250 and oh maybe well 300. yeah so i mean no it depends so that okay, was because because let's the last one I did was a full 20 inch one packed on a pallet so it takes mm-hmm. up a good amount of space oh in his van it's a good yeah, size okay. yeah it's a good size job whereas mm. the other stuff's smaller and like if you're just sending like um a 13 inch if you're just putting the dimensions of the 13 inch monitor put pictures of it online somebody could probably just show up and whatever they're driving and put it in their passenger seat yeah and just watch it right sure. if they're going to and then just usually they'll just go and they're dropping off along the way. So I'm sure that a lot of people even consider doing that. So, um, then you can go in there and you put your dimensions where it's going and it gives you again, the guided rate. So you could take that information. Okay. And then mm. you go back and you go, well, let's say how much is it going to cost me to pack this? I know it's going to be no, 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 all this packing. And then on top of that, you could go and you go to the shipping company's websites and get an estimate from their website on, how much it costs and if you have your dimensions right you'll get an estimate within three dollars of what it actually costs Mm -hmm. so uh you could always know you could say okay well if i go take it to fedex it's going to cost me this much packed to ship Mm -hmm. or i can send it unpacked via you you know how much is that difference so Mm -hmm. that's that's always something yeah that's a good idea of of how to market or figure out the difference between costs on there Good man, that's good. Good good advice on how to compare. What are the options? It doesn't have to be dog shit. Yeah, wrapped in newspaper, punted down the hallway. There are some reasonable options out there. It's good that you explain that. Well, and at the same time, it's funny because people and I constantly buy them off eBay, and a lot of my repairs coming up are going to show how I bought this thing and how it showed up when it was shipped to me. Mm. It's just. Um, You'll, I don't understand. It's, 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 there's no rhyme or reason to it. You could have an awfully packed monitor and somehow it doesn't get damaged. And then you could have one that has been packed like amazing Mm -hmm. and it comes and it's destroyed. So it's unfair and it's unfortunate, uh, but it is the way it is. And that's why you will be able to buy or try to buy monitors like I have on eBay and somebody will literally wrap it in a single layer of bubble wrap, throw it in a used box, mm. and ship it to you 700 miles away. And somehow it it arrives fine, even though you're thinking, holy crap, if I ship this thing, I couldn't even do it for the price that I'm buying this for. So there are people just taking that risk. Um, and they're not, obviously, if they were charging, you know, some of them you can tell because they're charging like, three hundred dollars to ship one of them they know mm. what they're doing others yeah. you're like oh man i don't know why you put this this price oh let's see what happens <laughs> it's fun man rolling dice Whew. all right so i think we've kind of got to the end of the episode here we got through ship that's a good one man i think that's yeah. the title of the episode that's a good one advice on shipping crts i like this we came to a yeah i place. think that's that's fun and it's something that i probably will not make a video on um mm really and i think that again no matter this should be we've talked about two good things here we briefly talked about rgb mods true and so just like to recap a little bit both of these things are good things to like to to if you're if you're in crt stuff these are two points points to consider Mm -hmm. if you want to do some 
service work, start with a cheap CRT that's got a good, try to find one that you can find that's available cheap and that's got documentation on. And then if you need to ship the CRT on the other end, um, instead of just going in and paying whatever it ends up costing to ship it, uh, you can always sit back and get these factors ahead of time, do cost analysis, and see um, whether it's worth your time to do something higher end like you ship. Mm, absolutely. All right, nice man. Well, maybe we'll wrap it up there and sounds uh, good. Keep going. We're still trying to let's work on the next guests. We got a few coming along, so yeah, I think next the, episode the, will be guest one or a guest. Yeah, one, I'm sure. We're trying to trying to alternate them the best we can. So. All right, I'm gonna. I because I th I think this week I think I want to work on my consumer 14 inch Trinitron with the and I think I want to have a go at the yoke. Just just see if I just touch it a little bit. Is it just enough to just center it a bit? Yeah, let me know how that. Open it and show me some stuff because at the same yeah. time, if I have an opportunity, I'll open my 14 inch PVM and we'll look at that yoke. Because again, after I RGB modded it. I was like, what happened? Because it's like it all of a sudden looked like warped. And I was like, this looked better before I messed with it. I must have moved the yoke. So uh, maybe we could both open those and, and look at them. Yeah, doing good. All right, mate. Let's end it there. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We appreciate that. Follow Steve's channel, RetroTac. I'm sure you're already doing that already. And don't forget, you can follow Steve on Patreon. When you uh, become a member of Steve's Patreon, you also get access to his Discord server. There's a lot of good conversation, and it's also the place to connect with Steve if you're looking for his services and uh, the different things that he offers as well. So check out the Patreon there. Steve, thank you very much for another week. Thanks, Lewis. See you next right. time. See you. Bye-bye.